Jeff from the Women's Center, um, and Scheidler, Ann Scheidler um, was with us that day. And we've been talking about working um, with the center to help with um, women that have the laminaria um, uh, procedure done and uh, change their mind and have been helped to, to change their, their mind in um, support of life. And we at Resurrection would like very much to be able to work with you in, in providing that service and providing it in a, in a way that is um, respectful uh, for the women and, and their experience with us. So we're looking forward to our meeting today. I'm going to ask Ann to introduce a very special guest that we've been very blessed to have today to, uh, to talk to us. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to just share a prayer um, that we've been um, saying with many of our employees um, to ask God's blessing on, on the unborn. God and Father, you are the creator of all life. You knit each of us in our mother's womb. You know us before we are conceived, and you have great plans for us once we are born. We beg you to spare the lives of the unborn and to help them give their contributions to society in the future. May all life, which is your gift, be respected and loved and cherished by each of us and those who follow us. Amen. Amen. And do you want to do the introductions? Sister, um, I'm Ann Scheidler with the Pro-Life Action League, and uh, we are so appreciative that Resurrection is so enthusiastic about working with us to help women who change their minds at the last minute. Our role as the Pro-Life Action League is that, that we train sidewalk counselors who go out to the abortion clinics and offer alternatives to the women. When one of our sidewalk counselors is successful in um, uh, getting a woman to choose life, we refer her to the Women's Center, and the Women's Center is a crisis pregnancy center that offers all sorts of resources and counseling and referrals to doctors and follow through to help the women, uh, you know, in supporting them in their choice of life. But sometimes they need services that are beyond what is possible for them to do on site. And Resurrection Hospital is the closest hospital and clearly the one that would be um, most cooperative with us because of their capital reverence for life. So following our, our meeting um, of about three weeks ago, we invited uh, a couple of doctors who have experience in this realm. You're going to hear first from Dr. Tony Levitino, who comes to us from Las Cruces, New Mexico, by way of Minneapolis early, early this morning. Um, Dr. Levitino was in practice in upstate New York for many years, and he did abortions as part of his practice. And through a, a personal tragedy, came to, to confront the fact that he was taking the lives of other people's children. And he now works tirelessly to, to tell people the value of life. He just, last night, gave a presentation at a fundraising banquet for a crisis pregnancy center in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Um, he has spoken here for the Women's Center, and he'll, he will talk to us this morning about what women face when they're when they have made that abortion choice, and what they face when they have changed their minds and choose life, and what it involves <coughs> to have to reverse that procedure in a late-term abortion. Uh, Dr. George Dietz is also with us. Dr. Dietz is a local um, physician who's in practice for many years and who has been uh, willing to um, take these patients in, on an emergency basis for several years now, where he will, will remove the laminaria. So now, Dr. Levitino has a, a plane out of Chicago at 11 o'clock. We have to scoot out of here at about quarter to 10, so I'm going to ask him to come up and, and um, speak to you first, and we'll have time for questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ann, and uh, thank you for inviting me. As Ann mentioned, uh, in years past, I was an abortionist. I did first and second trimester abortions in the, uh, between 1980 and 1985, I performed 1,200 abortions, including 100 second trimester abortions, up to 23 weeks of gestation. Um, laminaria is the key to increasing the safety of second trimester abortions and actually late first trimester abortions as well. 
Uh, I apologize. I meant to bring some. I actually had some in my office, and I was running around the last two days and forgot to grab a hold of it. The Lavin area, as most of you realize, is uh, basically just a small cigar-shaped device. It's about that long. It's very thin. Uh, and it's actually tightly wound sterilized seaweed made in Japan. And these are used as a hydroponic dilator. These uh, laminaria tents, as they're called. I'm not sure why they got the name tents. Uh, but these laminaria tents are placed in the cervix in preparation for an abortion. Uh, suction DNC is still RU486 notwithstanding. Suction DNC is still the standard method of first trimester abortion. DNC dilatation and curatage has been around a very long time. And as all the physicians know, the most dangerous part of a DNC is the D part. Dilation is the most dangerous part. You're going to be, we usually use metal dilators um, to open the cervix. This causes its own problems, which are a little beyond the scope of the conference, in terms of infections, cervical lacerations, and, and more and more data showing an increased risk of preterm birth associated with abortions is probably because of forceful dilation of the cervix. In the early stages of pregnancy, the first trimester, seven, eight, nine, up to maybe 10 weeks, more often than not, I would not even utilize laminaria. The cervix did not have to be dilated very much. A dilation of a cervix up to about uh, an eight Hagar, equivalent, useful for an eight week termination, Hagar dilator sizes, are more or less commensurate with weeks. So if we had an eight-week cervix, I would dilate it up to an eight Hagar. Up to an eight or nine Hagar, you really don't need the laminaria. It doesn't really add much to the procedure. But if you're going to go beyond 10 weeks, uh, certainly up to, you know, and first trimester DNC can easily be done up to approximately 13 weeks from last period. And you're really going to, I mean, you can forcefully dilate the cervix to that point, but it becomes increasingly difficult, and we're talking about greater and greater trauma to the cervix. So along came laminaria. These laminaria tents are inserted in the cervix. For a first trimester abortion, I would typically do it the night before. Um, you can easily, normally fit one or two or sometimes even three of these things inside the cervix. And what they will do is absorb water slowly over the next eight to 12 hours and dilate quite considerably. As I said, these are very thin, maybe a millimeter in diameter when they start. And when, when these things have absorbed water, you remove them, they're typically thicker than a cigarette. They're usually three, four, five, six millimeters across, and that slow process dilates the cervix. When you get into second trimester abortions, then the need for laminaria is even greater. Uh, the cervix has to be progressively dilated to greater and greater diameters to be able to accomplish the procedure. And we would typically do multiple laminaria insertions uh, for an early d &E abortion, 14 to say 18 weeks, I would typically do at least two insertions eight hours apart. So I bring patients in two days ahead, do the first laminaria insertion, as many as I could get in, typically two or three at first, bring them in the next morning, remove the laminaria, reinsert more laminaria, as many as I could get in, five, six, seven sometimes. And these would progressively dilate the cervix. Two and sometimes three applications of the laminaria would get to a point where you've pretty sufficiently dilated the cervix and don't even need the metal dilators any longer. And that, as I said, increases the safety of the procedure. It kind of brings up just a side topic I'll bring up quickly. Um, now, of course, we have partial birth abortion for those physicians willing to do them. Uh, Dr. Tiller was murdered uh, you know, last year, as many of you know. And one of his um, employees, Dr. Curtis Boyd, I guess with Dr. Tiller out of this, off the scene, Dr. Boyd decided he's going to become Mr. Third Trimester Abortion. And lucky me, he moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, just three hours from my home. And he's just carrying on the tradition of, of, uh, of Dr. Tiller. I bring that up because uh, you often hear about the whole discussion about partial birth abortion or intact DNA or DNX, as it's called now, um, dilatation and extraction, they had to, had to come up with some new name for the procedure. Uh, one of the arguments for uh, keeping partial birth abortion legal was because, well, we need this to save women's lives, which of course is a joke, and I, and I tell this to people so they understand clearly why it's a joke. If you read the original paper Haskell wrote on the annex abortions, he's very clear again about the whole process of dilation. Without 